Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Marissa Waterman. I'm the marketing director here at the Academy. Here with us today, we have Dr. Juan Vasquez, a board certified engineer who's the executive vice president at RJ Bay Hair Company. Today, Dr. Vasquez will be discussing the 8.5 square mile area limited curtain wall. Also joining us today is our executive director, Dr. Daniel, Oth Daniel Other. Dr. Other will serve as the moderator today. During the presentation, you'll be able to submit a question by clicking on the Q&A icon on the bottom of your screen. Before we get started, Dr. Other would like to say a few words. Good morning, Dan. Good morning, Marissa. Thank you. Uh, thanks all for being here today. Uh, I'm doing great. I hope you're doing well. Uh, today, I'm really excited about our webinar. This is a subject that I don't myself know a whole lot about, and I am thrilled to learn more. And of course, that's one of the benefits of being part of the American Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists. Board certification lets the world know that you're the best of the best. And learning from others in the Academy, it's a great way to explore new areas, pick up new information. So today, I'm pleased to introduce Juan Vasquez. He's the Executive Vice President of RJ Behar and Company. Juan has nearly 40 years of experience in diverse areas like stormwater master plans, draining studies, and street improvements. He's the co-author on numerous reports, including Florida's Department of Transportation Exfiltration Design Drainage Handbook. Juan is a professional hydrologist. He's board certified by the Academy in Water Supply and Wastewater. And today we'll be hearing about the 8.5 square mile area limited curtain wall. Before I turn the floor over to Juan, I wanna take a moment to say thanks to the patrons of the Academy. The support of patrons is essential to the financial security of the Academy and their contributions support the future of the profession. Thank you, Academy patrons. Also, I'd like to mention something very important about today's presentation. In 2023, Juan's work was recognized with the Honor Award in Environmental Sustainability in the Academy's Excellence in Environmental Engineering and Science Competition. So not only are we learning from someone who's an expert, as evidenced by his board certification, we're hearing about an award-winning project recognized by peers in the Academy as among the best of the best in 2022. Juan, thank you for joining us today. Audience, please be sure to put your questions in the Q&A and I'll moderate a discussion near the end. Juan, if you wanna turn on your camera and your audio, the floor is yours, welcome. Uh, thank you, Dan, and thank you, Marisa, for the uh, nice introduction. Um, let me go straight to the project. The the project we're going to cover today, the 8.5 square mile area, is part of a larger uh, studies to uh, related to the L31N uh, seepage barrier, and at the same time, it's a, even part of a larger project uh, to restore the Everglades. <clears throat> Credits to to the team. Um, the owner of the project is the South Florida Water Management District. The design team uh, included our company, RJ Behar and Company, as the prime um, project managers for the project. Uh, WSP, formerly known as Wood Environmental Infrastructure, was our geotechnical engineers. Madvikar Consulting performed the hydrogeological modeling. Tierra South Florida Inc., a local uh, geotechnical uh, firm, did the exploration, geotechnical borings exploration. Within surveying, also local firm did the land surveying. The construction uh, was done by management was done by TSF Geo, and the contractor was Geo Solutions Inc., which is a company that specializes in this type of work. So we're, we're the stuff that we're going to cover today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the background and, and give you uh, some ideas where the project came from. Uh, we're going to cover the location of the project, the problem that we we're trying to solve. Uh, and then goes through the design process, the construction elements of the project, and then we'll open it to questions and answers. Uh, to the right, I'm showing a picture uh, right bottom of the Everglades. Uh, for those who, who knows the South Florida er area, the Everglades is considered uh, an international treasure. And th this is a view uh, in the project area. It's basically a, a wetland area that has a a lot of international and uh, national values. The 8.5 square mile limited curtain wall project 
uh, has approximately 2.3 miles. The, it started in April of 2021 uh, with a project construction cost of $13.9 million. It had also a contract uh, a time of 360 days. And that's the, the first segment of the project, which is already completed. And currently there's a, another segment being constructed, which is called the CEPP New Water Seepage Barrier. It, that one has a length of 4.9 miles. It's a little longer than the other one, almost double. Um, it has a bid of $42.258 uh, million and a contract time of 790 days. So uh, to give you a little background of, of the project, uh, this uh, graphic on the left side shows the or, uh, historic patterns of drainage or flow of surface water flow in South Florida. Basically, um, the water starts at the north end, just below Orlando in the Kissimmee um, lakes and rivers area. It follows the Kissimmee River to Lake Okeechobee. And then from Lake Okeechobee, it flowed south and, and, um, and westward towards the Florida Bay. And that area is what's all basically the Everglades area. With the Central and Southern uh, Florida project constructed in the 1950s or so by the US Army Corps of Engineers, um, the drainage patterns were changed uh, and that affected the, the way that the Everglades receives water. Um, it, the project allowed for the South Florida area to develop but it, it did have negative impacts on the, on the Everglades itself. And so the plan, the comprehensive Everglades restoration project aims, and that's the picture to the right, aims at restoring as much as possible the original patterns by sending by, uh, water again as, uh, to get the water right to the Everglades. Uh, it's, it should, I should note in the slide, that all of this occurs in a very flat area, which is the area of South Florida. There's only about 12 to 14 feet difference between the lake and this southern part of the Everglades. Here's another um, picture, a little, looking at it a little closer. So we got uh, Lake Okeechobee. From Lake Okeechobee, the water flows through canal systems. And now it's being uh, intercepted as much as possible with what the, the, they're called STAs or stormwater treatment areas and water conservation areas, which are natural areas that are uh, uh, basically wetland areas that are um, where wildlife, you know, they, they, there's hunting and fishing and things like that allowed in those areas. And then it, it goes through the canal system that was built by the Army Corps in the 50s, the Central and Southern Florida project. And then it, it gets diverted to the, to the east and that affected the, the Shark River Slough and Taylor Slough um, by reducing the amount of water that normally ran through there. Uh, so the construction and operation of the historic disturbed the natural flow of water into the park, leaving Western Shark Slough unnaturally wet and Northeast Shark River Slough unnaturally dry. The pro the, our project, um, as shown here in the circle, is basically at the edge between what's Everglades natural areas and the developed areas of South Florida. Uh, for, for giving you uh, some points of reference, on the right um, side of the picture is Miami Beach, the famous South Beach. And uh, the, the road that crosses the uh, area from east-west is the Miami Trail. At the eastern end in, in Miami area, the Miami Trail is also called Calle Ocho or 8th Street, which is the famous um, area where you find all the Cuban restaurants and the uh, little Havana area and all that part of, uh, of Miami. And so the, our project is, is located just south and west at the edge of the Everglades uh, from the developed areas. Another picture, this one is rotated, is a blow up of closer to the area. And uh, I outline the two projects that we're referencing, the 8.5 square mile limited curtain wall, which is the uh, yellow line is 2.3 miles. The wall is built along the L357 levee, 
which we, you're going to see reference in, in the presentation. And then the green line the, is the new CEPP water seepage, which is the four point mile uh, section that is being built currently. Uh, within the 8.5 area, which is what basically the area in inside of the inside of the levees, there is a canal, the C357 canal, and to the south you see the L331N uh, levee and canal, um, which we're going to also talk about a little bit in the presentation. So the problem that we're trying to solve, and um, this graphic I obtained from, um, from the South Florida Water Management District, the project owners. At the top uh, graphic, um, we have in the middle, basically the 8.5 square mile area is, is by where you see the little houses and the palm trees. You got the Everglades National Park on the uh, left side. Uh, you got the L31N levee and canal on the um, right side of the picture. And what, what's happening is uh, if you're trying to send more water to the Everglades National Park to restore the flows, then that area, which is, is low, would be subject to flooding. So, so one of some of the projects that were built uh, currently already is, uh, and I showed you in the picture uh, be, before, uh, before, the C357 canal was built in the area uh, of the developed area. The 357W levee was built to protect the area from flooding from the additional waters on the Everglades. And the idea was that the, le the levee, um, we, you could raise the water in the EMP and the levee would protect the areas. The C357 would collect runoff and be pumped out to protect the water. Uh, but what happened uh, after that project uh, was built, it didn't really resolve solve the problem because what you see on the picture to the right, that is a picture of a uh, sample of the rock that is underlying this whole area. So you can see it's very porous. It, it's almost like a, uh, a channel where water would just uh, move through freely. So the levee would uh, hold the water, but the water would then go under the levee and still uh, impact the residential areas. Uh, for reference, the, the picture on the top left is the L357 levee. You notice that uh, it's only four or five feet high. It's not a very tall levee. The picture on the top right is the uh, Everglades National Park side, uh, which will receive would receive quite a bit of water. And then the picture at the bottom is a picture of the residential areas that are um, in the inside, uh, separated by the uh, levee, 357 W levee. So the, how the project started, um, we um, the project started by doing an exploration of um, bo uh, borings, uh, geotechnical exploration along the L331 levee. It included 55 borings done at 70 feet depth. Um, there was a core, uh, rock coring done, uh, both at four inch diameter and a two inch diameter. 32 locations were four inch and 27 were with a two inch diameter cores. Uh, 28 of the borings were then used to, for doing uh, geophysical testing and five locations were singled out to do monitoring wells to measure water levels and so on. Out of that exploration, the um, ground was divided in three stratums, the sandy gravel stratum at the top is basically the embankment of the levee itself. Stratum number two, it's very soft to hard, to very hard limestone, uh, which is that picture that I had showed you, the, the rock below the, the area, underlying this area. And then deeper, there is a, a what, they, what is called the Tamiami formation, which is a sand layer that is, more, is considered more uh, impermeable. Here's pictures of the samples that were collected. Um, they were measured, collected. Some of them, you know, the rock came out in, in pieces and some, some pieces came out fairly um, good of the cores 
when they did the drilling. After doing the, the borings, then there was a geophysical testing done. The testing included uh, radiation, uh, included uh, measurements of the uh, borings or wells, um, included um, water quality measurements, including temperature fluids and, and so on. Uh, included also sound uh, and pictures of the, uh, the along the boring itself and water quality testing, including pH, oxygen, and so on. The information was all collected and plotted on the graphic you see to the left, similar graphics for each uh, boring that was tested. That uh, effort was done by a subconsultant of uh, WSP called Golder and they prepared these uh, graphics with all the data that was collected and, and each uh, boring that was tested. Um, by the way, I should clarify that I'm a civil environmental engineer. So some of these is very specialized uh, information uh, you know, that was collected by different specialty engineers. And so if, if you guys have questions related to some of these very specialty items, I might not be able to answer them, but I could look into the answers uh, later. Then after doing all the testing, um, L JLA Geosciences uh, performed evaluations to determine the flow zones through the rock formations. They divided the areas in, into different flow zones and they estimated the hydraulic conductivity through those flow zones. Um, values estimated range, range from 105 to a million square feet per day uh, of flow uh, through those zones. Then that day, all that data was used by our um, hydrogeological uh, modeling consultant, uh, Matt Beaker, and they, did, they took all that data and developed a mud flow model of, of the project area uh, to evaluate the different solutions for the uh, seepage barrier. They divided basically the zones in, in 10 layers. The one I'm going to concentrate most is uh, layer number 10. It pointed out in there. Um, that is basically the, the bottom layer uh, between the rock formations that are called Miami limestone or Fort Thompson formations and the Tamiami formation, which is the sand layer uh, at the bottom, which is considered a more impermeable layer. They did the, the, they put all the information, created the models, and then they performed calibration. The calibration was performed against actual uh, information that has been collected through the years at several wells that are in the project area. LPG1, the top graphic, it's located at the northwest corner of the project, LPG, or uh, actually at the southwest, and LPG2 is uh, at the northwest. And so they had data that related to flow, flow or rainfall information for a period from 19, 2016 to 2018, being the uh, summer and fall of 2017, the the air, the time that there was the wettest period in in the, the period that was studied. And uh, this graphic in in red, you see the historical data that is collected from the wells. The blue is what the model predicted, and the gray line um, in LPG one just above seven and NLPG2 is just above six, is basically the ground elevation. So any uh, part of the graphic that gets above six means that the groundwater is flooding or the project area is flooded at those uh, well locations. So they, you can see the, the uh, historical and the model, you know, the model predicted fairly close to what the historical uh, measurements were. Then the, uh, they created the flow paths to study the different um, depths at which we could build the uh, seepage wall or the cutoff wall. Uh, they created this flow uh, paths A through E. Uh, notice that A and E are the flow paths at the edge of the end of the, the seepage wall that we were proposing and past the, the end of the seepage wall. 
and that is good to evaluate whether the model is actually they're performing you know what it's supposed to do this is a table of results of the modeling is it has a lot of information in there but let's concentrate on on the base w10 uh, highlighted there the 10 is the the bottom of the formation the rock formation at the interface with the tamiami formation which is a sandy layer and in the table uh, red uh, indicates uh, an increase in in flow while blue indicates a decrease in flow so you could see in the left part of the table a b c d e are the flow paths blue were reductions and, and red were increases. The flow paths at A and E are showing increase. And it makes sense because that's basically at the uh, once the seepage barrier no longer there, you, we expect that the uh, flows to increase. The Of all the uh, uh, alternative, each, each one of those lines re reflects one uh, option or depth of the seepage barrier and the level the 10 going to, all the way to the to the bottom was the one that produced the best uh, reduction in seepage uh, the second part of the table uh, indicates uh, the reduction in terms of percentage negative means that it actually increased rather than decrease but in, in, in some areas, it in, in decreased as far as much as 98% of the seepage flow. And on the far uh, right of the table, at LPG2, um, it shows that the from the base model, uh, the time that the area fl was flooded in days versus uh, what, with the wall, it got reduced from in, in October to 4.38 is an elevation and five uh, days flooded. And the, the picture on the right side is the LPG2, uh, a picture of the, and I, what I'd like to notice is that when this picture was taken, there was no seepage wall and you could see how the area is flooded and the, the well area, basically the groundwater is at the surface in the, uh, the ground elevation. They, um, the modeling also was uh, showed us a comparison of water levels uh, versus the base. The base was a calibrated mo model, the groundwater model. And the blue is what the uh, wall at layer 10 uh, predicts in reduction uh, in stages of, of the water surface or the groundwater surface. And you could see in the in the middle uh, uh, how in some areas it reduces the water levels significantly. Another uh, way of looking at it was using contours, groundwater contours, with and, with, and without the, the wall. The, on the left side, you have the base model calibrated base that shows you know the ground water flowing towards the, the east but anywhere from elevations from 7 to 4.5 or so and on the uh, right side you see how the model predicts the water levels to basically be reduced in the middle of the area to about 3.5 in elevation and the contours then get stacked against the uh, the seepage, the proposed seepage barrier. So <clears throat> what is a cutoff wall? Um, a cutoff wall is constructed by filling uh, the, the trench with a mixture of native soil and bentonite. Uh, it's called a soil bentonite wall, SB wall, or a cement and bentonite mix, CB wall, which is what um, was recommended for the project, or a mix of soil, cement, and bentonite. For the project, which um, we don't have a lot of soil available to, to use for mixing, the CB or cement bentonite wall was the best alternative uh, due to the lack of other uh, soils to be used. Uh, in addition, the, the rock has large voids and cavities, 
and it was suspected that the cement in the mix would help backfill and penetrate those voids to help plug them as the cement seeds up. The picture of the uh, to the right shows you the typical dam levy. Um, you know, you're going to have a flow from the higher water levels in, uh, on the one side of the levee towards the, the other one. Uh, and the idea of the cutoff wall is to find uh, an impervious stratum where we, you can uh, found the, the cutoff wall and eliminate that, that seepage pattern that was causing the problem in our case. The design process started with the preparation of plans. Um, we had to decide you know, what, how do we make sure that we are reaching the bottom of the, the, the Tamiami Foundation formation? And so we decided we wanted to key in the, the wall at least three feet into that formation. Uh, we, we had the borings for the project along the project area. And we had, so with that, we had a pretty good estimate of the depth uh, at which we would find the, the Tamiami formation. And we requested that the contractor key it in, it went into the Tamiami information at least three feet. Another uh, part of the project that we had to define, we had to define the construction limits and the staging areas that contractor would need to set up a batch plan to mix the cement and bentonite. And so, um, you know, we put all heads together and, and came up with, uh, with these construction limits. And the main reason is uh, those in, within those construction limits, the area would be disturbed by truck traffic and equipment and so on. And since these all are considered wetland areas uh, with the ones on the Everglades side more valuable than the ones on the, on the inside of the levee, but they're all considered wetlands and we had to estimate the impacts to wetlands in order for, to, for our permitting. We also had to do a risk analysis and determine or estimate in terms of risks, um, what would be the potential for the wall, if something happened to the, to the levee or wall failure uh, to avoid a, any breach in the levee that could affect the area if the water levels in, in the AMP were high, uh, such as like a lake, lake level type thing. And, and so the project included the design of a filter system that was uh, uh, located in several strategic locations uh, so that if there was a breach of the levee during the project, that it, it would avoid uh, piping of the levee and flooding um, in the areas inside of the levee. We had to prepare plans for the, the project area. At the south part of the project, uh, the levee fall or there's really not a levee, it's an embankment that we were building the seepage wall. It's next to a canal. And so in that area, we had to widen to be able to, to build the seepage wall. And that's the first section at the top. Uh, the, the one with the cloud is shows a, it's a new levee section that we had to build uh, for the seepage wall. Uh, uh, to to connect two pieces of the existing levy. Um, the in the center right is the construction of the seepage wall through the existing levy. We actually built it right in the middle of the of the existing levy, and then we had three options at the bottom of details for capping the the seepage wall, whether we had a grass um, an area that would be grass at the end. We, have, we also had to cross an existing road. So we developed a detail for crossing that road. And then we had the regular detail uh, of capping the seepage wall in the areas of the levee. That's the picture to the bottom right. We also had to develop specifications. Uh, the, the specs were basically the, developed from scratch. Uh, for the project because the district, the water management district didn't have a spec for this type of seepage wall. Um, the specs included the, you know, the, the indicating the scope of the work the contractor had to do, what applicable standards had to follow, uh, provide all the characteristics and testing that we wanted of the seepage wall. In the case of the cement, cement bentonite wall, the permeability we were looking for was uh, less than nine 
to 10 of them to the minus six centimeters per second for permeability. We also came up with um, what's called a proof of concept. A proof of concept was um, an area, in this case was 500 feet, where the contractor was going to build a sec section of levee and seepage wall and test all of the means and methods, including in the case of our project, blasting. Uh, his blasting design to soften up the rock below so they can be ex excavated, the trench could be excavated. And in that proof of concept, he was gonna test his blasting design, his mm -hmm. construction methods to, and test test the wall and the, and, and the ty different types of mixes that he could propose for providing the, the rest of the project, showing that the, what they did in the proof of concept area can be done for the 2.3 mile rest of this project. We also had to obtain permits, including federal permits, the wetland permits, the section 404, because these um, levees are part of the central and southern Florida flood control project that was built in the 50s and so on. We had to obtain a section 408 permit from the Army Corps. Uh, state permits, including the modification of the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, uh, FDP uh, with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, they had assumed the MPDS construction general permit from their uh, uh, from the government, from the federal government, the EPA, and so they issued that that permit for us for areas that you, where you have more than one acre of disturbance. The contractor would need water for his project. And so they needed to obtain a water use permit to use either groundwater or water from the canal systems uh, for their mixing uh, of the cement bentonite mix. And also there were local permits in Miami-Dade County, uh, which requires a permit for blasting and uh, for the contractor to close, uh, uh, close or adjust any of the local streets for their means and methods they had to obtain uh, maintenance of traffic permit. Once with the project went to construction and GeoSolutions was our, our contractor selected, they, the first thing they told us was how they were going to build the project or stage it. Um, in this picture, they told us where all the equipment was going to be, including the area for the owner's uh, trailer for inspection. Uh, equipment staging and the locations uh, where they were planning on putting their batch plants. Uh, here's one first thing that you, you know that we learned. Uh, what we projected that they could do with two batch plants, the contractor told us they, they needed three locations to build the batch plants. And so we had to go back and adjust a little bit our, our construction limits to make sure that we um, were able to allow the construction means and methods. Here's a picture of the uh, southern end of the project, and, and that's a, the area of staging. They were setting up there to build their, their batch plan. It gives you an idea of what the staging area lo looks like for them. This is a uh, proof of concept area. Uh, in this area, of, uh, roughly about 100, 500 feet, the contractor had to build up the, the embankment to the same elevations of the rest of the levee in the project. And then in that area is where they were um, building uh, the first segment of seepage wall and testing all of their uh, construction method that they were gonna use for the rest of the project to make sure that uh, what they did here would apply and it was feasible for the rest of the project. They uh, provided the CB mix design, the cement bentonite mix design for approval. Um, they provided different mixes, two, three, four, or different types of mixes with different results that were tested in the laboratory. And number four is the mix that they selected uh, to meet the criteria of the project that had to provide um, at least nine to the minus six um, um, permeability. Then the, the construction started with uh, drilling. The drilling is done to set up the charges for blasting as a second, the second phase. And blasting was uh, when we all 
were designing the project, we realized that in order to get to the depth of the seepage well that we were planning, uh, some of the areas of the rock are fairly hard and we figured that the contractor would need to do blasting in order to soften up the rock and be able to excavate it and excavate the trench. In, in here, the, in this picture, they're setting up the charges uh, along the alignment of the seepage wall. Uh, on the picture of, on the left side, I'm, I'm pointing out to LPG2, which is what is the one of the wells that we studied. And in the picture, you could see that before the well, uh, the seepage well was built, uh, you could see the wet um, water levels on both the uh, both sides of the levee. Uh, so the levee was there, but water was getting under the levee and flooding on the other side also. This is a, these are videos of the cluster. After the, the rock was blasted, then the contractor used a rock trencher. And this is a huge machine that basically excavate um, a rock trench with fairly straight walls down to create the, the trench for the CB wall, the cement bentonite wall. Um, you could see the pictures of the machine. It's, it's, it's fairly big. The picture on the top right, it was a machine they used on a previous segment of five miles that they built. And then the picture of the bottom is the one that actually was used in our project. And on the left side, you see how the machine is cutting through the rock uh, and leaving the trench open for, for the future um, construction of the CB wall. Now between the opening the trench and actual um, pouring the material to create the CV wall, the contractor backfilled the trench again with the excavated soils um, to, to keep the trench from caving or so on uh, until the actual CV wall was constructed. Here's a picture of the machine working as they excavate the trench, it, it puts the material on the side, then that material was put back in the trench until the, the CV wall construction came behind. Uh, the machine that was used in this first segment had a, a cutting uh, chain of 35 feet deep. Uh, below that, the contractor used an excavator to remove the, the rock material. This picture shows you the batch plan that was built to mix the cement and bentonite mix. On the picture on the right, on the right side, you see the force line uh, where the material gets pumped all the way to the to the CB wall uh, area construction area, and here you can see the um, after the the trench, you know the trench is backfilled temporary with a, a loose material, then this rock um, this uh, long reach excavator comes back, removes the all the material all the way to the bottom. Uh, at, roughly at 60 feet where we wanted the, the trench to be uh, keyed in into the Tamiami formation. And behind it, you'd see the, the hose uh, pouring in the uh, CB material and filling in the trench with the mix uh, to create the cement bentonite uh, wall. You could see that on the, on the right side of the picture, in the right side picture, uh, the CB wall uh, starting to harden at the surface. Uh, as they, they're pumping the material to fill in the, the trench. This is the uh, picture of the Long Reach excavator. That excavator um, is not very common, but it's got a length of about 60 feet in, in length to reach the bottom of the, of the trench. It's a huge machine. There was also a need for quality control. So the contractor set up a system to do soundings, basically to determine that we were uh, at the depth that we needed to be. And then they collected also samples of the CB material 
at, the, at different depths to be tested in the laboratory uh, for permeability and other properties to make sure that uh, the wall was, had the properties that we had specified. Kind of similar to concrete testing, you know, where they basically pick up a, 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 a cylinders to be tested later. In this case, they picked up sample of the at the different depth of the CB wall to be tested for permeability and others. After the the wall is uh, completed and and it sets, the cap has to be built. Those were those details that I show you in the plans. Uh, in this case, uh, we're um, building the wall in the levee and the cap consisted of 12 inches of lime rock material uh, similar to a rock base on a rock road project the rock base that would be built on, on underneath the asphalt pavement or so on that that similar material was then the one that was used to cap the the cb wall and seal it on top to protect it from traffic and so on um, the picture on the left shows an area where, you know, the uh, old levee had a bunch of turns and we decided we didn't need to have all those turns and have the old equipment trying to follow that up levee. So in that area, we just built a levee, new levee elevation and, and put the CV wall in that levee and connected two segments of the, of the existing uh, wall. Uh, the picture on the right shows that uh, southern segment the southern segment was also where the proof of concept was built. And you can see here the picture of the levee finished after the cap uh, of the CB wall was already completed. Uh, this picture shows some, some of the areas already completed on the left. It's the same southern area by the canal. Uh, and there you could see that the sod is already being uh, laid out on this embank uh, uh, embankments or slopes of the levee. On the picture in the right, I'm pointing again to LPG2, the well. And in this case, the wall has already been built, the CB wall. And you could see the Everglades uh, side is flooded. And the inside of the levee area is dry. Here again, another area of the project where the levee was already completed, uh, the CB wall completed. You can see how the Everglades is flooded, uh, but the areas, the uh, residential areas are, are dry. The ground, the groundwater is not to the surface. Uh, this is again the, at the southern end of the project. Um, it's hard to tell, but the, actually the water on the, on the right side of the levee there is a little higher than the water in the canal system on the uh, in, um, left of the, le the levee that we built where, the, where the, we put the seepage barrier. And more importantly, the residential and agricultural areas are, are basically dry. Other pictures, uh, this is a LPG2, and you could see pretty good amount of flooding on the Everglades and the areas inside of the levee are dry. Um, during the project, we had some lessons learned, for example, um, Originally, we had laid out the seepage wall to take the turns that the levee did, you know, the radiuses that the uh, existing levee had. The contractor came back and told us, you know, it, it, due to the equipment that we're using, we, we, we'd rather not do that. Um, and instead, what they did at the corners, when they turned, they basically built, built an X where the seepage wall cross each other. Uh, con maintaining the continuity, but then it made the turning for the um, truck rock trench a, a lot easier. And to do that, they had to widen a, a little bit of the levee temporary, and then the material was removed later uh, to, to mm -hmm. just keep the area that was needed for the levee and the permanent wall. Another lesson learned, um, if you're not careful with, with the blasting, you could damage the levee. And then in this area, um, at, it was actually towards the end of the project. The, uh, they did the blasting, uh, nothing happened. Not, nobody could see anything uh, normal, but then when they came to do this, the trench, um, the levee cracked. 
those were deemed like uh, basically sections of the of the rock below that that slid and created the failures on the levee. And um, so the contractor had to come up with a grouting system to repair all those uh, cracks and reconstruct, reconstruct those sections of, of the levee. Uh, so the le lesson learned for the second segment, the contractor decided not to use blasting. And what they did is that uh, they built a humongous uh, trencher that reaches to a depth of 57 feet. And so they don't have to uh, uh, do any, any blasting at all. That was a lesson learned from this first segment. Uh, during, for the grouting, there was also testing that had to be done to make sure that the, the grout uh, went into filling all the uh, cracks uh, below. And, and the picture on the right, those were borings that were done uh, to follow the grouting. And uh, a chemical agent was used uh, uh, over the rock or the, the recovery material. And the, when the agent touches uh, cement, it reacts and turns uh, like a purple or, or pink color. And that was done to verify that the grout had reached the depth that we were looking for. And that is uh, my presentation. And uh, we can open it to questions and answers. Juan, thank you. That's fantastic. I really appreciate that. And, and, and good job kind of uh, focusing on the time. <laughs> well done. If you want to stop your screen share, then people kind of be able to, to see us a little bit bigger. Um, but I have put together some questions and I've kind of I've kind of put them in uh, in, in some in some categories. So um, one of the things we had was just some some let me kind of go through these and then we can kind of come back and, and, and bite them off. Um, you know, there's there's a question about the background. You know, it's called 8.5 square mile, but we heard a lot of linear. So people want to understand where that 8.5 square comes from. We got a few detailed technical questions, right? So you've got some blasting in there. The, you know, there was some questions about like what size charge? What were the criteria for selection? Is there some concerns that those could fracture the karst? Would that increase the seepage? Another detailed question is ultimate cost, right? I mean, this is $15 million for about 10 square miles. So given the size of the Everglades and everything, what are we talking about to actually build this out to the full scale that we would imagine? Um, so that's one. Um, we had some questions about sustainability, climate change, right? Higher sea levels, uh, stronger storms, uh, worse storm surge, right? When you put these barriers, water can't go one way, but it also can't go the other way. So what's this going to mean for the seepage or the kind of movement you might want to have happen before and after storms? And, and how is sustainability ranked in this specifically? Was there any kind of system for sustainability ranking? So, so how does that factor in? There were some project management questions, right? Like unanticipated outcomes, um, what what happens with subsidence on the residential side when when the water movement's not going the way it has been in the past? So, and permitting, uh, you know, it, this is a, a sensitive area. There's a lot of stuff that's being moved around. What did it take to get some of those permits? Uh, and then finally, an education kind of question, hugely interdisciplinary. So this is an awesome example of what environmental engineers and scientists can do with civil engineering, with hydrology, you know, kind of across the board. But how do you train up future people so that they can do this kind of work? So, you know, we'll come back and kind of take these one at a time, but I just wanted to paint the big picture. So folks loved your presentation, came back with lots of questions. Maybe we'll go back up and start at the top and, and, and some of the background questions. 8.5 square mile. Where do you get square mile out of something that talked about a whole bunch of linear build? Okay, the the square mile is really the, the description of the area that we're protecting from the seepage wall. It's also wow. called Las Palmas community. Got it. Okay, so when you that, say square mile, that's that, the area that's been protected. That's where the 8. That area was roughly 8.5 mile. Uh, square miles of, of area that was being protected by the, the levy. Uh, the, the term had been used for a long time. There was even before this project was, uh, that I got involved, there was other projects that also had the 8.5 SMA in their, in their name, 
because it for a long time the the district and the army corps and all the stakeholders were way, looking for ways to protect that area from flooding uh, because the the whole goal is to send more water to the everglades and as the water goes up in the everglades there was always the the you know the problem that the the water would have the 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 problem of flooding these residential agricultural areas and right. so that that's why the levee was built uh, the canal system was built the canal is is connected to a pump station that helps wow. eliminate that water so it's not just all passive there's some active engineering going on here as well right. so and so the levee was like okay we're still getting flooding in the area because the, the water's finding ways to get around us mm. <laughs> and it, it was going under and so that's what triggered this part of the project. Makes sense. Well, so now some technical questions, right? So, you know, some some blasting, uh, you know, concern about fractures. So, you know, I, and again, you you admitted right out of, the, out of the start, this was highly interdisciplinary. So can you speak to any of that? I don't want to put you on the spot. It's also okay to defer if you're like, you know what, that's not my specialty. But But can you speak to, you know, what were the concerns that the blasting didn't make it worse? Well, the, 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 um, there was, um, the, we actually had some specialty engineers at the Army Corps, at the district, the water management, and and uh, as a subconsultant to us, looking at the blasting specification. The the blasting specification for the district was completely reshaped, redone to uh, to make sure we address this project, and uh, the design of the blasting itself was the left to the contractor as part of his means and methods. Okay. But the specification was a performance spec. It, it required, you know, there was areas where we knew the levee was fairly close to residential areas. So it required um, a specialty seismograph being installed to measure vibrations. Uh, it required um, going before the project and taking pictures of all those homes and areas and be able to have all that information in case something happened, we could say, yes, it, it wasn't like that before the project or it was before like that before the project and it wasn't the project that caused it. The contractor did eliminate some pieces where they said we're not blasting in this area because we're too close. Um, and so those measures were taken even by the contractor. Um, and so the, in those areas, they it was harder to excavate the rock. They had to use the trencher and the backhoe and just work and worked at it until they were able to build the trench. Yeah, old fashioned. Uh, right. And then they, they also were required to obtain permits from, from Miami-Dade County. And I believe they had to obtain permits from the fire department uh, um, as, a, as a, you know, the in charge of blasting. Now, blasting is not uncommon in South Florida. Okay. Um, a lot of the uh, developments in South Florida had to be blasted uh, to, to be able to excavate the rock below to create the field to, to be able to build developments. Okay. And, and we also have quarries that use blasting in order to, <laughs> to soften up the rock and be able to excavate it for quarry for either field or lime rock or different uh, construction materials. Uh, we don't have like mountains that we can just excavate and obtain field and stuff. We actually have to get it from underground. So blasting is it has been fairly common, and then a lot of municipalities have blasting ordinances that protect the residential areas from from you know blasting operations and so on. And so um, you know, I guess it was certain level of comfort that. The, there was enough contractors that knew how, knew to, what they were doing, how right? to do blasting in South Florida to be able to get the job done. That's that's a very localized issue. That's that's really interesting. Now, how about ultimate cost, right? I mean, this this is this is one piece of what will. I mean, you know, the Everglades is what one one and a half million acres or something. I mean, it's some it's huge. huge, right? So the project and, and I had I think I think I had a picture of the total um, geotechnical exploration that was done. Where the 55 borings were done, that is the whole basically lens of the L31L uh, or 31N uh, levy, 
it's about 27 miles. Wow. Okay. So there, there is a potential for building another 20 miles of this seepage wall, roughly, uh, to protect the basically the areas um, on the inside of the Everglades so that they can actually do more projects to send more water to the Everglades. Now, the, the water management district also has some regional models. And they, um, with the information that we did at the local level, uh, the mud flow model that we did for our specific project, they took uh, some of that information and plugged it in into the regional models. And the regional models uh, basically analyze, okay, if we cut off that water move movement from west to east, are we affecting um, wells, water wells that are on the on the eastern part for the developed areas? And the the you know that regional model was done, and it was determined that that uh, the impacts would not be significant to the to the water wells because uh, I mean the water is still there at the depths that that are collected. You know the the sure. the, the use for for wells for drinking water wells. Um, and much deeper, much deeper than the, than the surface that you're looking right. at. Right, and and what we were really getting was, you know, to meet our project uh, goal is to lower the water level two three feet, mm -hmm. so that the areas don't flood right from from groundwater. Right. Uh, they still they still have other issues. The area is still flat. Uh, the the it's not graded engineer in an engineer way to where you you right. take the water and run it to it's still gonna when it rains still there's gonna be some localized flooding but it's caused by the rain in the area itself not by the water that is being sent from from the Everglades well and that's that's a good transition point right so so climate change right so you know wetter storms frequency difference uh, storm surge worse as there's more energy in storms right so so thinking about the design horizon, right? I mean, you know, somebody put those, you know, you're talking about legacy canals from the army from the 50s, right? You know, I mean, they may or may not have thought about 2023 when they were doing a 1950 design. You know, what are what are your horizons that you're thinking about as you put this in? How do you how are you accounting for sea level rise, wetter years, higher storm surge? How does that factor in or does it not? It does. Um uh... The, the regional model that the district has, they continuously are updated and run as, you know, as they do more projects, they, they plug them in and they can see what's, what, how, what happens at, at, at a more regional level, right? Because they're much larger models. Um, the, the way the seepage wall is built, we actually have, a, have it at elevations that are higher than what was, would have been needed. Um, if you remember the picture I had of the typical cutoff wall, right. it starts at the bottom of the levee from the bottom of the levee below, because normally levees have a core in the middle that is fairly impermeable. And in our case, the levee was already there. So it's not like we're building this, this, the cutoff wall and then putting the levee on top. We already had the levee there. So our seepage wall is just a foot below the levee top. Okay. Okay, so the seepage wall is actually much higher than than, and that should provide, you know, for different variabilities in in, in flood conditions and 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 so on at the ENP uh, side if they need to raise them for some reason or lower. Now, in South Florida, almost all the waters move by gates or pumps somehow. Sure. Because all these canals uh, that you see built in they. There is either a gate control structure just before it goes to the ocean, or there are pumps that move it east or west, depending on how, how it's needed. And all of that is managed by the South Florida Water Management District at a, a control, you know, they're, they're called the water managers, <laughs> a group called the water managers. And so a lot of the water, even though, you, you know, we get all these rainstorms and, and so on, um, but a lot of the water basically has to be moved with pumps, and, and that really controls a lot of the, the flows and where they go. 
See, we we would have all we would have just all focused on Colorado and 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 you know thought about that river and forgotten what's going on in an area with so much water. So so how does sustainability fit into this, right? I mean, you you know you you want a project you know on sustainability. How does that factor in, right? I mean, if this just leads to uh, you know more development, if this leads to more, I mean, how how does all that factor together? How is this making the environment more sustainable? Um, kind of across the whole range of people, planet, and prosperity. If you can speak to that a little bit. Yeah. Well, in terms of future development, not a whole lot of future development is feasible really in South Florida anymore, right? We we are pretty much uh, tapped out uh, because we we have basically a line that we cannot go any further west, okay. and and that is the. Everything that is developed pretty much is separated from the Everglades with a levee or a canal system. And so we can't really encroach in the Everglades anymore. So that ensures sustainability in the sense of, you know, no more land is gonna be taken from the, from the wetlands, Everglades conservation areas uh, for development. The, you know, the, what's happening in South Florida for the most part is redevelopment is uh, there There might be a few areas that uh, were remaining agricultural and those might get developed into another land use. Uh, and there were some, um, you know, close to the coast is basically all neighborhoods are being redeveloped for, and so, but it's, it's just changing the type of land use, but not necessarily a lot of more um, development that's in more impervious area consider you know so density dens densities may change and, and use may may change but but not total acreage uh, and in terms of you know the overall uh, sustainability well you know the everglades right i took some notes the everglades has, has been considered an international treasure a world heritage site an international biosphere res reserve and a wetland, a wetland of international importance. So those are some of the descriptions of what the Everglades is. It's not just for us here in Florida or even for the United States. It's a, it's a wetland that it's a, needs to be preserved forever for the whole world. And in that sense, this it's you know small project really compared to the comprehensive Everglades restoration project in total it's finally finding a solution to one that was you know that area that was causing problems that didn't allow some of the other projects to be successful sure so you know for example the tamiami trail there were some areas of tamiami trail where the embankment was removed and a bridge was built to allow water to flow underneath to, to connect, you know, the flow paths to, to, to move that water to the Everglades. Well, a lot of the water cannot be moved if we are causing flooding problems uh, in some residential areas. So solving this little part of the puzzle is really opening up so that all, the, all those other projects are uh, basically reached their goal of moving that water and pro providing the water that the Everglades needs for future generations. Perfect. Now it makes it makes sense, which kind of leads us to our next set of questions, right? It was kind of in the project management. You know, you you showed us that you did some, you know, there was some risk analysis done, right? But but those unanticipated outcomes, right? I mean, barriers from water moving work both directions, right? So you get you get the wrong kind of water on the wrong wall and it can't get back the other way. We think about what are the benefits of the water moving. And so as we, you know, as we put an impediment there. We think about subsidence. So, so how did you think about some of the unanticipated consequences here? The, you know, the unknown unknowns, you know, the black swans, but, you know, but actually step back a little bit and think about, you know, the areas where you could set down and say, as a technical expert, here's some areas that we need to consider that probably haven't been considered in the past that need to be thought about now. What kind of unanticipated outcomes did you look at? Well, in the, uh... In the risk analysis that was done, the, the risk was uh, mostly um, considering, okay, if this levy fails during construction for a reason, one or the other, you know, what can we do to um, mitigate? Um, part of the mitigation is 
since a, a lot of the water that is sent to the Everglades is controlled by the water managers, right? The, some of the, the conditions and, and there was a close coordination between the project and the water managers at the district as to when they, they, they were necessarily needing to send more water mm -hmm. so that we could prepare ahead and make sure that the, there was no degraded areas of levee for repairs or for whatever reason. And, and they, then they could send more water. So all those scenarios were looked at. Uh, as, as the big picture, I think I you know, mentioned before, the larger picture was looked at, at the district by examining the, the regional models and, and what that did to groundwater downstream. Um, you know, the, the SMA project area, the, the, you know, that residential Las Palmas community, now that they have a canal system in the middle where, you know, any water that falls in that area now has a, a quicker way to get to the uh, um, discharge point. And then the district has pump stations that actually can help it drain quicker if, if, if for some reason that area is, uh, it had received a lot of rainfall and whatever, but no, no longer, the, you know, the, the hope and the, the goal of the project is that no longer the sending, sending more water to the Everglades would cause them flooding. Sure. And I think that that has been achieved. Uh, it's, it's, it was evidence in those pictures that I showed you at the end of the presentation where you can see the Everglades flooded and the areas, you know, in the inside basically dry. Okay. And that was, that was like, uh, that made a lot of people happy that, uh, I, can in, I can imagine you got a pat on the back job well yeah. done right <laughs> yeah and, and in terms of costs this um this the seepage barrier um you know the the army corps of engineers deems i believe it's any seepage or cutoff wall more than 40 feet it's not cost effective in their design manuals and we needed to go 60 feet but at the end, when we compare to the seepage barriers that are being built around the Lake Okeechobee to reinforce the Herbert Hoover Dike, uh, in terms of uh, cost per, per mile, this, this job turned out to be a lot uh, cheaper. Huh. Now, we, we're still doing testing and um, the, the, the difference is that the, I think the seepage barriers are being allowed the Herbert Hoover Dike use the stronger materials um okay. the, the the i think the psis are there they achieve are higher and we were building this seepage wall with a softer just cement and bentonite mix okay um which i think it's only like 20 psis of strength it's not very strong in terms of uh you know compressive strengths mm -hmm. Um, but it turned out to be in, in cost per foot a lot cheaper than the walls that they were building, which then would allow the district to build more miles of it, you know, extend the dollars to, to create this, uh, this seepage barrier. That makes sense. Makes sense. Well, that and that just kind of brings us to kind of the, you know, the last question, which is in this interdisciplinary space, right? I mean, this is obviously a huge project, right? And, and huge, both in its scale, but also in its disciplinary expertise, because you got everything, you know, from geotech to what's going on with the science to what's going on with the hydrology. I mean, like it's, it's not a, it's not a straightforward kind of one person goes out <laughs> and does something here back of the envelope calculation and they've got this figured out. So, so speak a little bit to what it's like to try to manage some project like that, to interact with that kind of diversity of folks and speak a little bit to you know the the next generation, the future environmental engineers and scientists. What should they be doing so that they can do these kind of important projects in the future? Yeah, um, in you know it required quite a bit of co coordination. We had a lot of stakeholders involved. You know, for once, you had the the Army Corps of Engineers, which is the, they by Congress are entitled to manage uh, or monitor all these projects that are being done to modify the original project that they built in the 50s, right? In 50s and beyond, because they kept building things. But uh, so every time that we have to modify any of these levies or projects or canal systems, we got to go back to them and obtain their approval. Um, 
So the army was uh, corps was very involved. Plus, they have a lot of experience in building levees and and seepage walls. Like they're you know in charge of the ones at, at the Herbert Hoover Dyke uh, around Lake Okeechobee and so on. So they brought that expertise and expertise from other offices of the Army Corps, not just Jacksonville, so to, to bear in the, on the project, specialty like the blasting, you know, specialty people like that. Then we had the South Florida Water Management District, and they have their own very capable and very specialized engineers from hydrologists and hydrogeologists and, um, and geotechnical engineers and geologists and all of that. And they were involved in reviewing the project and the and the model, the you know, the regional model, they executed it themselves. We had the Everglades National Park Service people. Uh, their concerns about you know what, what's going on with Everglades and and the accesses. So they 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 needed to cross the levee to access the Everglades. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were involved in and they, they all show up in the meetings during construction. They also have people at those meetings where they we're discussing, okay, we're going to have to close the street for a short period of time. And the parks person is saying, okay, uh, when from when to when, I need to notify my people. So all that coordination is done on a weekly, uh, uh, bi-weekly basis during the construction. And they were involved in the design and then in, in the construction. Um, we had the US US. Um, geological service. The first uh, uh, geophysical testing, they were the ones that performed it, showed us how to do it. And then we had our uh, subconsultant uh, uh, Golder perform the rest of the of the borings. But they 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 were the, involved and and they provided all the testing that they had done in this area prior. Um, we had then, you know, all the firms that were involved in my team, uh, you know, as a subconsultants and then subconsultants of the subconsultants in some cases. Uh, so th there was a lot of coordination. Um, you know, we had uh, constant meetings, uh, scheduled meetings, and then uh, specific meetings for different particular details that needed to be uh, discussed that maybe didn't need everybody, but just a, a specific group that needed to discuss them. Uh, and all that was done, uh, it was done in actually fairly short period of time. Once the decisions were made as to the depth of the wall and, and, and you know, it was fairly quick for us to prepare the plans and then have everybody look at the specifications in that uh, part probably we spend the most of time is in preparing the specifications uh, because the, the plans, Really not, not that complicated. It, it's it's basically developing an alignment and details for the seepage wall. Is the specs the part that really has the, you know, what tests you're gonna perform that on that wall once it's built? How you're gonna collect the samples? Uh, you know, what are the criteria for performance of this? You know, permeability of the wall that we need, and then all of the stuff of what that went around the preparing the blasting and the monitoring of the structures around the project uh, to make sure that we weren't impacting or causing damage to anybody. And so part of what I have done, you know, I found the project super interesting from the beginning. This is the second time I've done a seminar on the project. And because I, I recognize, uh, at least in my mind, you know, it'd be good to show what we did here and how we went through this whole process. And as many people as I can listen and, and learn from it, um, the idea is that, okay, this is a tool that could be used if you find a problem of, in, of this situation. And it's not a uh, dam per se, you know, the, the levee was fairly low, but not a lot of places have a, an issue with groundwater flow like we have here in 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 South Florida, with a, a rock that is very porous and uh, moves <laughs> a, a large amount of water on the ground, one way or the other. And oh, so, wow. well, it's a fantastic project. There's a few more questions in the in the Q and A, which we can circle to. 
And I know that folks um, will be, I'm, I'm sure you're happy if people reach out to you and, and we'll provide the contact details, but uh, it, it is obvious to, I'm sure everybody on here, why this was selected for an award in this year's Excellence in Environmental Engineering and, and Science competition. So let me offer my uh, congrats on a fantastic project and just an amazing presentation. Your explanation was 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 very clear. I've learned tons. I'm sure everybody else on here has learned tons. It's one of the benefits of, of being a member of the Academy and talking to other board certified engineers and scientists. So Juan, thank you so much for all you do for the profession. And um, uh, we're looking forward to continuing to see fantastic work from, from you and your, your organization. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. And thank Marissa, you for we'll turn it over to you. <laughs> okay, thanks, Dan. Thanks, everyone, for your questions. And thank you, Dr. Vasquez, for sharing your knowledge with us today. If you have additional questions on the topic, you can reach out to me, and I'd be happy to put you in touch. We enjoyed being with you all today, and we have several webinars planned in the near future. So you can go to aaees.org slash events, and you can check them out and register. If you're interested in sponsoring an upcoming webinar, please reach out to me directly. And just a reminder, if you're not yet an AAES member and you're considering joining the Academy, please email me and we can discuss our membership options. Last but not least, our PDH certificates for this event will be sent out shortly. That's all for today. Thank you so much and have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.